All right, let's talk about multiplying. This is one of those sermons that some people are going to be like, oh. But we need to talk about it because it's who we are. We, uh, we talk about who we are as a church in these terms. We've kind of narrowed it down to these three phrases. We live to glorify God by being disciples who make disciples. Say it with me. Ready? We live to glorify God by being disciples who make disciples. Lots of churches um, say this, but stop at the second phrase. We live to glorify God by being disciples, full stop. I'll serve him with my life. I'll look as much like Jesus as I can. Won't be perfect, but that's my commitment. But if we stop there, we miss the message of Scripture. The message of Scripture is that we live to glorify God. Everything exists for the glory of God. Just so you know, in the end, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody got that? Okay, that's the truth. And we who have understood that uh, before that time comes are known as disciples. We're Christ followers, and, and we live and exist in a world uh, where most people aren't following Christ, and we want to and seek to follow Christ. But our following of Christ must include us being disciple makers, our replication, our duplication, our multiplication is the truest expression of our discipleship. I spoke here uh, in this same room 12 years ago, 13, I don't remember, uh, but I talked about us being pipes and how God is meant to flow to us and through us to a world that needs him. It's not meant to terminate with us. We're not ponds, we're rivers. The living water of God is meant to flow into us and out of us to a world that desperately needs. So, that, so, so listen, you don't have to have a, a seminary degree or a job at a church to be a discipler. You're a discipler if you're a disciple. It is a part of the DNA that you are meant to rub off on, encourage, uh, and uh, where needed, speak the truth and love to those who need to follow Jesus with you. It's just the deal. Now, we talk about... Uh, this statement in, in terms of four major areas, and we've been talking about them throughout this whole series that we call the four. Uh, we understand that we need to worship uh, and worship God and him alone. We need to belong. We talked about that last week, that uh, we need to belong to God and belong to each other in relationships. We need to multiply. We're going to talk about that today. And then the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to talk about serving him. But I thought uh, before we got going with multiplication, I, I, I'd help us maybe understand how these four things work together with our discipleship. So let me kind of go a little bit further. It, when you think of worship, think of worship as the fuel of our discipleship. Uh, there's an ebb and flow in life, isn't there? Like we sang earlier in, in the songs that we sang, um, uh, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Anybody sang that one this morning? Some of you weren't here yet, but trust me, we sang it. Anyway, uh, um, when, when, when we breathe, it, it's ebb and flow. Breathe in, that's the ebb, flow, breathe out. So much of life is that way. We eat in, and then we empty ourselves, and then uh, we, we, we eat again. It's, <laughs> that's not how I wanted that to sound. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but that's just how it goes. And it's the same way in our spiritual existence. Worship is that breathing in, that taking in. Of God, it's, it's, it's done in, in, in corporate settings, it's done in personal settings, it's, it's done as you're driving to work and your, your mind is set upon the things of the Lord. You draw him in, but it's meant to be a, a, a draw in and then release out existence. Worship is the fuel of us going and being a part of God's mission in the world. Belonging then is the context of our discipleship. If worship is the fuel of our discipleship, belonging is the context. So many of the, of the things that God commands of us in, in the scripture can only be realized in relationship. Like, you know, you've got to be in relationship with people uh, deep enough and long enough to where you can love them as God tells us to love and where you can serve them and where you can um, forgive them. You, <laughs> you've got to be in a relationship uh, to where you can be offended <laughs> so that you can uh, seek forgiveness and seek reconciliation. Belonging is a context. The multiplication, like we're going to talk about today, it, 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 it's just God's greatest hope for our discipleship. It's God's greatest hope. There's other parts of our discipleship. Don't get me wrong. I'll preach those, have preached those. There's other areas of life where we can be more and more like Christ. But I believe uh, that God's greatest hope for his disciples, that is his disciples would make more disciples. In fact, that's the central mission of the church. 
That's why the church went from, you know, uh, a, a few hundred the first day of the church to a, a 3,000 plus those few hundred after the first day of the church to thousands and then millions upon millions. It's because disciples didn't just keep it to themselves. Disciples understood that Jesus came so that they could know and so that they could tell others that they might know. It's God's greatest hope for our discipleship, that we'd be useful to him in his mission that others might know. We're going to talk about service over the next couple of weeks, but if worship is the fuel and if belonging is the context and if multiplication is God's greatest hope in our discipleship, then service is simply the overflow of our discipleship uh, in these acts or these, these um, things that we do that, that honor those that God loves uh, in the world. Uh, many of those service uh, acts will be done uh, in these gifts that God has given us to function in within his church. But, but service goes beyond gift. It, it, it basically goes to the whole humility and self-sacrifice that God calls us to. It says, I'm going to put God first and others before me. And I'm going to live my life so that others might have and flourish. I'm a servant. We'll talk about that over the next couple of weeks. But today I want to talk to you about better multiplication. And the question I want us to answer today is why should the church multiply? And there's a myriad of ways that we could tackle this, but I'm just going to, for the sake of time, uh, kind of summarize with three. Um, the, the three reasons today that I think we should multiply as a church and that the church should, uh, for the last 2,000 years, have that as its mission is because multiplication is what Jesus did. If we're going to be Christ followers and truly follow him fully, then we follow him in his multiplication mission. That's what he did when he was here on earth. Uh, we as a church seek to multiply because that's what Jesus demands. You read the red letters, uh, he, he speaks about it often. I'm, I'm reaching you and, and, and drawing you to myself, not just so that you can have, but so that others can have through you. It's his demand that we go and make disciples. It's what Jesus did. It's what Jesus demands. And then finally, like I just said a second ago, multiplication is, is God's greatest hope for our discipleship. It's where we uh, learn him and, and learn about him in, in ways that we wouldn't learn him otherwise. It's where uh, we, we, we uh, you know, become parts of his mission and his work in the world. You and I get to be the, those conduits, those, those tie-ins to his redemptive work in the world. In fact, listen, let's be honest. Even if you're not a Christian yet and you're kind of checking this out, you're probably sitting here, probably, I won't say 100%, but probably sitting here because someone invited you or someone told you that you were missing something or, or you know, someone you remember from way back when you were a kid going to a church, you know, at a vacation Bible school. There was somebody who did something that drew you to here. There's a bunch of you in here who already are Christians. Good to have you. And you're a believer. You're a follower of Jesus Christ because some other follower of Jesus Christ explained to you what it was to follow Jesus Christ. This is how it works, church. Normal people, run-of-the-mill Christians, avail themselves to the Holy Spirit and the work of God, and they speak the truth to those who don't know it, and people respond under the direction of the Holy Spirit to that truth, and their lives change forever, just like yours did and mine did. That's how it works. So let's talk about that. Let's start with multiplication being what Jesus did. I'm not going to read the whole of the Gospels to you, but I encourage you, if you haven't read them for a while, prove, you know, prove me wrong on this. When Jesus came to earth, I'll do Luke's Gospel. He was born in the first a couple chapters. That's Christmas, Right? Okay, good. And, and then uh, we, we really don't have that much uh, about Jesus from uh, the time he's about three years old until the time he's 30. In fact, only uh, in, in Luke, in, in the latter part of Luke chapter 2, we see Jesus as a 12-year-old getting lost at the temple. Remember that? It's basically all we got for like 27 years. But around the age of 30, uh, Jesus comes out of the woods. He meets his uh, cousin, John the Baptist. We talked about that last week. John the Baptist does his name. He baptizes Jesus, Right? Father, I was there. The Holy Spirit was there. Son was there. Trinity was there. It was cool. Uh, but then Jesus leaves that baptism experience, and he goes right out into the wilderness of Israel. He spends 40 days without food or drink, and he's tempted by his adversary, Satan himself. It's a, a stealing process, a, a, 
a, a, a testing time for the Son of God. He passes with flying colors. And he comes out of that fasting and, and testing time, and he, he comes back to Galilee. Doesn't go to Rome or even Jerusalem or the government seats were. He, he doesn't head off to some Pharisee, some seminary of the time to be able to learn things. He just heads to Galilee. What does he do? He starts talking to people. He starts hanging out. He starts telling them in careful portions initially uh, about uh, his message, his, his hopes for the world. And, and people start following and they call him rabbi. They uh, they, f- they follow him uh, first, you know, in, in smaller numbers, but then in droves, and, and, and he grows in popularity, and he continues to teach and, and share, and more people follow. And then he starts saying, you know what, we could probably should get some, some closer ends. I'm going to form a leadership team. And he taps some of the least likely leaders to become part of his 12. I mean, if you and I are forming the 12, we're not picking his guys. He picks fishermen. Not, no, if you like the fish, that's not bad. Anyway, uh... But, he, but he, he doesn't go for the, you know, the, the, the obvious choices. He actually walks up, in Luke chapter 5, it tells us he walks up to a guy who's a tax collector. His name's Levi. He made my jeans. And uh, it tells us in verse 29 that Levi, uh, oh, I'm sorry, i got to tell you this story first. He walks up to Levi in verses 27 and 28, and he, it's real simple. He just says, it's real short. He just says, hey, come on, you're following me now. And Levi gets up. And he leaves his lucrative position as a tax collector and he starts following Jesus. So as, as Levi starts following Jesus, he obviously needs a, a few weeks or, you know, to get things settled. And, and is, is that where it goes? Anybody want to guess that's where it goes? No. Immediately what Levi does upon hearing from Jesus the good news that Jesus had to give is he forms a multiplication party. Look what it says in Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Levi made him a great feast. Jesus, come on over and eat at my house. And there was a large company of what? Tax collectors and others, the others who were at the bar, you know. Uh, And they were reclining at the table with them. What did Levi do? He did what uh, people who get excited about the gospel do. He started telling everybody else. Remember the woman at the well? She meets Jesus and Jesus, you know, tells her, yeah, the guy you're living with is not really your husband. Anyway, he says all these things that only God could know. And, And she, what does she do? Does she... You know, stand there and say, tell me more. No, he, she drops the jug that she had gone out to this well to fill with water, and she runs back into the town there in Samaria, and she says, you guys, you got to come see this. I mean, when people meet Jesus, the default setting is excitement, and i got to share him with my friends. That's what Levi does. And at the party there that night, uh, probably they were in this outdoor setting, maybe hanging out in the front yard or up on the roof, um, some Pharisees came by, and these Pharisees were kind of the, uh, the, the, the muckety-mucks of the Jewish religion. They had their friends, the scribes, who were the law keepers, the law transcribers, and they, they basically had formed this, this uh, you know, they, they were the two guys on the Muppet Show, you know, or up in the balcony. So you got to be old enough. But, uh, but they were basically just watching this party and saying, you know, this is terrible, this is wrong, and and finally, they, you know, after commiserating with each other, apparently decided they were going to confront the uh, disciples. Maybe they had known them from their hometowns or whatever. And so they went up to the disciples, some of the disciples, and they said, why do you guys eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Because this was so foreign to the Jewish faith. The Jewish faith was all about consecration and not becoming unclean. And so you could do that in lots of ways, but certainly one of the ways you could do that was hang out with people who lived unclean. And so these Jewish leaders came and said, what is going on? And, and I, you know, for so many reasons, I wish I was around in those days and I was one of, you know, those peripheral followers of Jesus. I would love to have seen this stuff because Jesus is apparently not close by because these guys are talking to the disciples, but Jesus is God. And so Jesus is able in other accounts in the scripture to actually read minds and respond to questions that people are thinking about. And here in this situation, he's able to hear these words and he just kind of walks up and he says, I'll take a stab at that one. I'd love to answer that question that you're not asking me. And Jesus answers them and said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, they need my help. He says, I have not come to call the righteous. Uh, and I don't know if he's you know, doing this as he's speaking to the Pharisees, giving a little, 
I'm, I haven't been called to come to those who don't see their need, who think that they're righteous in themselves. I, I've called, or I've come, and I've been called uh, to the sinners, to the ones who know they have a need. I like these tax collectors and the others. And I'm here to draw them to repentance. I mean, it's early in Christ's story, and he's already making it very clear, this is my mission. You can read the rest of the book of Luke. It basically follows that whole theme. He just keeps going over and over again to different groups of people, sometimes massive groups, sometimes households. He talks to that woman at the well and a Roman centurion. He talks to all these unlikelies, and he shares the good news with them. And those people follow him. It's like every day, that's what he's about. I mean, sure, he feeds people and he heals people and he teaches, but in all of those things, his central hope and certainly one of his hopes in all of it is that more and more people would know and follow him. He sends his followers, his his close ends, uh, out two by two so that they could get some practice doing this for themselves. And he does it all the way up until... His, his last week of life, uh, he's hanging out in a, a local town as he's uh, a week away from his cross. And he, he comes into this one town, uh, and he's celebrated at this time of his life uh, as a celebrity. Everybody surrounds him, just wants to be near him, just to talk to him, would love to have him to lunch. But he's walking through this one town, and he looks up at a tree, and there's another tax collector. He had a thing for tax collectors, what can I say? And this guy's name is Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. <laughs> and uh, he's up in this tree, and if you know the story, you know what happened. Jesus, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people are around him, and he looks up in the tree and he says, you, me, lunch. And that's what happens. And you can read there in Luke chapter 19 the story of Luke and Jesus' interaction. And we, we uh, uh, Luke, not Luke, Zacchaeus and Jesus' accent. And Zacchaeus says uh, to Jesus, hey, I, I get it. I'm, I've been wrong. I want to repent. As a sign of my repentance, I want to pay back everything that I've stolen from people because that's what tax collectors did. And, and I want to go beyond that. I want to, the grace that's been shown me, I want to show that grace in my response. And Jesus says, ah, he gets it. I'm paraphrasing. And then he, as, as just a, a matter of reminder, Tells all that were with him. This is the point. Because he says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. So multiplication is what Jesus did. Now here's why that's important to us. Because as Christ followers, we are committed in life to doing what Jesus did and still does. Or hopes to see done through us in life. And so if we're going to emulate Christ, certainly we want to, as it tells us in Philippians chapter 2, we want to empty ourselves. We want to be humble. Uh, as we see uh, his life on display, we want to, you know, turn the other cheek as he taught us to do and as he did himself. We want to, we want to do the things that Jesus did. Some of us, uh, other, you know, certain areas of Jesus' life, it's, they're, by God's grace, uh, easier for us to emulate. But all of us has, have been called as Christ followers to do all that Jesus did. So that includes multiplication. If Christ made it his mission to reach the lost, and he did, then it's our mission too. Now, becoming like Christ requires discipline. It's going to be um, two steps, uh, or what was Paul Abdul's song? Two steps forward, two steps back. Is that what it was? Opposites attract, something like that. I don't know. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to kind of stumble forward in this whole becoming like Christ thing, is what I'm trying to say. I'll give you an example. Of course, I'm about to preach on sharing, my, you know, sharing our faith, and so God gives me uh, you know, a softball. He just lobs one in there on Friday morning. I golf with a bunch of guys here from our church. It's one of my fellowship times. And so we got together. I'm about to tee off at the first tee at the golf course that we play here. And uh, there's three of us. We usually golf with four, but we couldn't find a fourth. And so there's three of us, which is fine. We'll get done quicker. I can get on with the rest of my day. It's perfect. And so we're standing there about to swing our golf clubs. And all of a sudden, one of the employees from the uh, the golf course rides up with another gentleman. He's got clubs. And (laughs) the guy from the golf course says, hey, this guy's a single. Uh, It's going to mess up the whole, you know, uh, run of things if we let him play by himself. 
can he play with you? And the earthly answer to that question <laughs> is no. If I had wanted him to play with us, I would have called him. I don't know who he is, but uh, has anybody been there? Anybody ever, you know, I mean, how, you're like sitting at, a, at a, a place to eat and someone says, is anybody sitting in this chair? Some of you have lied and said yes. <laughs> Just because you didn't want him to take the chair. That, I want the whole table. The human condition says, no, you can't golf with us. Find some friends. <laughs> I'm just being honest, right? But thankfully, in this situation, the Christ in me trumped the mark in me, and I said these words before I knew they were coming out of my mouth, sure, he can play. Now, just to be honest with you, anytime you've invited a stranger into your circle, it's awkward for the first little bit, right? You're trying to get to know each other, and, you know, you're kind of judge. you're not supposed to judge, but you're kind of judging each other. I hope he's a good golfer. Oh, I guess he's okay. Anyway, uh, so two or three holes of that. And then the Holy Spirit starts breaking through in, in that experience with me, and he starts saying, hey, is it possible that maybe I arranged this hostage situation for you, right? <laughs> I mean, for the next four hours, you're going to have this guy. You're talking about it on Sunday. Maybe you should share your faith with this guy. So two more holes, and I stood on the tee, and I said, hey, man, you go to church? He says, no, I don't go to church. And I says, well, we all do, and I'll tell you this right now. Don't go to our church. The preacher is horrible. <laughs> That's what I said to the guy. Thinking this would kind of be my ha-ha funny way to get in there. And he said, yeah, I heard that. Uh, <clears throat> The guy I'm riding with already told me. <laughs> so we laughed, hit our shots, and we kept going. Hole after hole, hour after hour, hanging out, getting to know this guy, laughing, joking. On the 16th hole, I had a phone call. It was a work call. It kind of distracted me. Uh, but uh, I don't know, two, three hours of hanging out in the presence of this guy. I mean, he's, he's captive. And what I wish I could tell you is right after I told the joke about me being a pastor, uh, I being the, 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 the older Christian, the more mature Christian, the paid Christian, saw the door open and I launched and I started sharing, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the things that I've been taught about sharing my faith. And I asked all the diagnostic questions and I, I, I got this guy talking about his life and his needs. And I, I, I wish I could tell you that I addressed all those needs with scripture and verses. And I, I explained the gospel to him to the point where when we got to the 18th hole, the, the four of us knelt around the pen <laughs> and held hands on this green as, as my new friend put his faith in Jesus Christ. It didn't happen that way. It didn't happen that way. Because once again... I, the follower of God, took the opportunity of God and just punted. I think I said something like this on the 18th hole. Well, if you ever do want to go to church, we're right up there on Kingsway. That was it. I got in my car and drove off after picking it up from the place it was being fixed. And, and just, you know, in the silence of those moments, just uh, communed with my Heavenly Father and He's so gracious, isn't he gracious? He's so good to you. He's, he's not, you know, he doesn't, as I pray and listen to him, doesn't yell at me, dummy. Are you serious? I mean, I, I know you're supposed to be a fisherman. I called you to be a fisherman. I, I had that fish jump in a golf cart for you. <laughs> but, hey, Mark, I need you to be ready for those opportunities. Here, here's why I didn't. Can I tell you why I didn't? I was busy playing golf. That's what I was really about that morning. That's what really mattered. The score on the next hole. Uh, I got distracted by other things. I, I, got, I got excuses for days, just like you do. Here's why I don't. Here's why. I, I mean, it's too weird. I don't know him that well. I mean, I, we could just go through them all. But the bottom line is this. Oh, and here, here's one of our favorite excuses. I don't know what to say. That's one of our favorite excuses. And then... I might not close the deal. Like, like sharing your faith is only good if someone becomes a Christian. 
Okay, first of all, let me dispel both of those. You know what to say. You, you, you don't have to have a degree in, in theology to know how to say, Jesus came, died, rose again, and he saved my life. How about you? That's, that, I mean, and listen, it, 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 it might be confusing. It was confusing to you when you heard it the first time. Certainly you should, if you can, be trained, and we'll try to train you in different avenues and venues here. But you don't have to be a silver tongue to share the gospel. You just have to be willing. And listen, if you're worried about closing the deal, stop that right now. The only one who saves is Jesus. You don't have to arm wrestle or headlock someone into salvation. You just have to be available and talk. And as God gives you opportunity, listen, you might just be the one who plants the seed, the one who waters the seed, the one who cultivates. You might just be a, a person in the, in the process of this person becoming a, a follower of Jesus Christ. But whatever your part is to play, play it. Just be available. You may not be like my friend Matt, who has a, a seeker life group that meets at his house, and he, he, he actually actively goes out into the world, meets people at the gym, and he says, you're coming to my house. And he starts sharing the gospel. Well, that may not be you. I wish, I, I wish for all of us that we'd have a chance to do that. I think it'd be amazing. Can you imagine what would happen in a church if everybody just got five or six people who didn't know Jesus and just started meeting with them at their house and sharing the gospel with them? I mean, even if just one of those people comes to Christ... We double. That may not be you. I pray we all get there someday, somehow. But let's at least all of us be available. Why? Because it's what Jesus did. It's who he is. It's who he was. He went to a dying world and he taught them how they might live. It's not just what Jesus did, though. It's what Jesus demands. Multiplication is a command from our master. We're not just called to be models. We're not just called to be like him in morality. We're called to be like him as missionaries. He seeded the idea early with his early followers. In Matthew chapter 5, he sits down with some of the very beginnings of his, of his followers. You know, it's early in his, his ministry years, and he, he sits them down on this mountain, and he starts teaching them what we come to know as the Sermon on the Mountain. He, he says a bunch of blessings at the beginning. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed uh, are those... Um, uh, are the meek and blessed are those who mourn. I got those out of order. But anyway, he says all these blessings and then he says these amazing things to these very early onset users, uh, adapters, that's what I meant, adapters, early, uh, early adapters of the gospel. He says to them, you are the salt of the earth. Anybody remember that? He doesn't say that to his 12, his like, his close ends at the end of his ministry. He says that at the beginning to people who are just barely following him. He says, you're the salt of the earth. He says, what he was saying there is you're the preservation. Salt is this preservative of that day. And he says, you're, you're here to preserve and, and to, to rectify the rot that is being brought into this world by sin. You're, you're going to be the salt of the earth. Stay salty. He says, you're the light of the world. He says, you're like a city built on a hill. Back in those days, no flashlights, headlights, there was no light. If you wanted to navigate in the dark uh, and you were in the countryside, you would basically set your compass, your, your guide by, the, by the, the homesteads, the cities that would be on the hill, the, whose lamps were lit. And he says, that's you, early adapters. You're the light of the world. You're going to lead them to truth, lead them home. Don't, don't hide it under a bush. Oh, no. It's an old song. You've got to let it shine. He said it this way to him in Matthew chapter 5. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Let them see you, hear you. Let them, uh, you know, see me through you. To what end? That they might give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What's the purpose of our saltiness? What's the purpose of our light? Early on, Jesus was telling his followers, you're going to be me. You're going to be the hope of the world in my absence. And for 2,000 years, it's been that way. He goes through his, his whole ministry. You can read all the Gospels. Uh, he goes through all those three and a half years of his ministry. And 
He actually gets to the very, very end. He's died and risen. He spent 40 days hanging out with his followers after his resurrection. And we are now at the beginning of the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote. And Jesus is hanging out there and and, and his disciples gather to him and says this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? This was a huge hope of those who had followed Jesus. They had expected a Messiah who would be political, who would come and rescue them from the grips of Rome. And they thought to themselves, man, this is perfect. I mean, we got a general who can't die. Like he came back from the dead. This is perfect. I mean, you can just fight everybody and we'll be Israel again, right? Is this the time? (laughs) And Jesus, who's been so patient with these guys, and continues to be so patient with us. He's like, oh, you guys. He says this. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. He says, all that stuff's coming. You don't fully understand. I get it. But, but let me point you to what you need to know. He says this, but you, you'll receive power with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll receive power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He just drew circles. He says, you're just going to take my good news out. And it's just going to keep going and it's going to spread through the whole world. And here we are. What's up, Christians in 2019 in America? You are the direct result of these early Christians obeying what Jesus demanded. And when he had said these things in verse 9, it says that they were, they were looking on. And as he was, lifted, uh, he was lifted up in front of their faces, a cloud took him out of their sight. He ascended right then. It was his last thing. And he was like, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. Bam. Whoop. That's it. It's his last words before he leaves. We give for different weight to last words, don't we? One more thing. This was his one more thing. Don't forget. As Christians, we tend to forget. We tend to forget the mission. That's why I'm talking to you about it today. We exist as a church to be disciples and make disciples. And bring glory to God. And and it was the same with this first church. While they were gazing into heaven, it tells us in Acts one ten, he as he went, uh, behold, these two guys just showed up. They stood beside him in white robes, and we see white robes in the Bible. Who are we thinking they are? They're angels. They're messengers from God. They're supernatural beings who have come to speak into this moment. And these angels said to the men of Galilee, "Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? What's going on? What are you looking at? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go." into heaven, referring to the second coming of Christ. Jesus is coming back. Have you heard that taught in church before? Jesus will return someday. Could be today. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Because whatever I have here, it dwarfs. It is infinitely less than what I'll experience in his presence. I believe that fully. Okay? So I'm ready for him to come back. But these guys, they're standing there and they're staring at this, I don't know what they were staring at. You ever looked at a balloon go up in the air? Remember when that happened when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. And you just stand there. Oh. And these angels come and they're like, hey, hey, fellas, what are you looking at? That the Jesus who just went up in the air is coming back. We gotta get going. People need to know. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you're going to be the witnesses. You're gonna be the messengers. So that more than just you get to see him again. And that's what they did. If you read the book of Acts, they go, upper room, Holy Spirit, come down. Peter preaches the first message. 3,000 people on the first day. I will tell you right now, as a professional Christian, as a church pastor, if 3,000 people church or joined our church in one day, first of all, celebrate, right? That'd be a good thing. But then panic would be the next thing, just so you know. <laughs> How are we going to assemble? I mean, 300 of you joined life groups, and we were ready for you for the most part. But if 3,000 of you joined life groups in one day, we need more leaders, Most churches would be tempted to say, okay, that's it. It's good. It's enough. It's too many. We've got to assimilate all of these. But the early church said, no, great start. Let's keep going. And it tells us that they never lost the mission. I mean, sure, they devoted themselves, like it tells us at the end of chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. That They had awe 
Every one of the souls in the church, everyone in the church had this awe, this Levi-like, you got to hear what's happened to me. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and day by day they attended the temple together, and they broke bread in their homes, and they received food with glad, generous hearts. There's food again. And they praised God, and they had favor with all the people. And what was the result? And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is our hope. That day by day, people that we know and do life with would come to know Jesus Christ. That they'd start their discipleship process. That they would grow to a point where they too would go out and join us in the harvest. You know, if you're a seasoned Christian like me and others in the room, um, (laughs) perhaps the excitement, the awe kind of has worn off a little bit. Church is more duty. It's more what I do on Sunday. But it doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. We should be like the blind guy in John 9 who Jesus gave sight to. And he just kept bouncing around the streets of his town saying, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. And he came to the Pharisees who said, how is it possible that this man who was blind can see now and and how is it possible that some common carpenter was able to you know heal him and and the guy just kept saying I don't don't know that's a great question I have no idea but here's the deal all I know is I was blind but now I see and then he asked this question of him hey because he was you know fresh into his faith fresh into his following of Jesus he says hey what hey Pharisees you guys want to follow Jesus too You want to be his disciples too? They kicked him out of the synagogue. Did it bother the guy? No, because he had this one thing. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Do you know that? Do you know that you were blind, dead in your trespasses and sins, lost, without hope? But when you found Jesus, doesn't matter if you were six or 60, when you found Jesus, You went from being spiritually dead, spiritually blind, to being spiritually alive and able to see. And the same joy I pray that you have in your salvation is the joy that God intends for other people to experience. It just takes his church going out. Because don't forget, multiplication is God's greatest hope for our discipleship. See, when we get excited about things, we, we tell people, like, like if you go to lunch today and you have a great taco, you're going to probably, if you're, you know, media savvy, you're going to take a picture of it and post it on your page or whatever you do, and, and you're going to let people know, get your tacos here, best taco I ever had. I, uh, I, I got a car, Eleanor and I got a, a used car, and, and so uh, there's everything that's used has things. And this, this car, the steering wheel squeaked. <laughs> Drove me crazy, right? Didn't notice it while I was test driving because I had the radio up. But, because uh, you got to test that too, right? But as soon as we bought it and all the signs, you know, I started noticing when I was driving quiet, you know, oh, it just drove me crazy. And so I was like, this cannot be. So I typed into my search bar, squeaky steering wheel. Here they came, 15 videos. All of them just normal dudes like me who were so excited about figuring out how to stop the squeak in their steering wheel, they took their iPhones and videoed themselves fixing it. And I watched one of those videos. And this guy was like, well, first of all, you got to know it's not up by the steering wheel, it's down by the pedal, so you got to come down here. So he goes down by the pedal, and he's, you, know, you can see his, his head, and he's watching the pedals. There's this little gasket down there where the steering column goes into the engine. And that gasket dries out sometimes, and so when you steer, sometimes that makes a squeaky noise. And all you need is some WD-40, and you put some WD-40 in there, and you just turn the wheel, make sure it's in neutral, but turn the wheel, and he says, I've already done it, this already works, but you just got to trust me. This is how you get rid of the squeak in your steering wheel. And he flung that out into the internet. So excited was he to know how to fix a steering wheel. So wait a minute, let me get this straight. 
People get excited about things, they learn, they're in awe of what they've learned and they share it. It's just a human, that's how we're wired. But why is it that Christians will get excited about a taco and post that? That, uh, <laughs> that we'll get excited about fixing a steering wheel. I didn't post a video, don't go looking for it. But I did come in the next morning at my staff meeting and tell everybody that I fixed my steering wheel. <laughs> but we'll get excited about that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the most incredible, exciting, good news that has ever hit the planet, that has ever made a difference in our lives, we just go mum. Or we get afraid. Or Here's my hope for us as a church. I want us to be better. I want us to be better at worshiping God. I want us to be better at belonging to him and to each other. I want us to be better at multiplying. That's what God hopes for our discipleship. So we're going to pray. Time to go. Will you pray with me? Bow your heads. We're, we're not a walk the aisle church yet. <laughs> but I'm going to give you a chance to make a commitment. Because a lot of times you can come to church and, and uh, kind of hear a message and be like, that was good, and then nothing. And so I want to give people a chance to commit. So everybody who's looking at me, stop. Bow your heads. Even if you're not, just, it'll just be a second. Trust me. I'm going to pray this with you. Lord, uh, here's my prayer for us, that you would open us up in our minds, in our hearts, uh, get us over our fears, over our sense, senses of our limitations, and that you would uh, enable us and empower us and give us opportunities like the guy that we golf with Friday morning, that you would just uh, make us aware of those things and then help us, God, in those moments to just say what we need to say about you, to be a part of your mission of multiplication. All right, that's my prayer. Keep your heads bowed. If you are here this morning, and that's your prayer, like this year, you would like to be better at multiplication. Here's what I want you to do. We'll start simple. If that is your hope for you and your life, if it's not, don't lie. But if it is your hope for you and your life, just stick your hand up in the air and let me know. Anybody here? That's your hope? Okay. Lots of hands in the air. It's great. Thanks, everybody. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go one more step. Here's the deal. As I've been talking about this, maybe someone's name has been flashing across your mind screen the whole time. Like you know that you know that you know that you're in this person's life at God's direction, that you're, you're meant to be the one who shares Christ with this person. So here's the deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity to accept uh, God's call in that relationship and, and to this week go from knowing that to doing something about that. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If, if this week you will... Uh, through text or email or through voice or you know, phone calls or through face-to-face, -face, just even begin the conversation. If you would walk up to someone that you know God has put in your life and say, listen, it doesn't have to be right now, but I really want to sit down with you sometime and talk to you about something that's so important to me. Can we do that? If you would be willing just to set up the appointment, I'm trying to put the bar as low as I can for you. If that's you, would you in the moment that we have in this quiet place with eyes closed and heads back, would you just stand if you sense God saying, this is the week, we're going to talk to this person, just stand, if that's you, and you're going to talk to someone this week. Here they come. It's good. It's good. Yeah, God. All right, the rest of you stand. We'll close in prayer. If you weren't standing, it's okay. I want God to get you there for real, not just because some pastor quieted a room and Someone in your row stood up too. But here's my prayer. Don't miss this. My prayer is that any, every one of us eventually, because of our awe for God and our appreciation for what he's done for us, every one of us would be willing at any moment to make much of him in the conversations and the interactions that we have with people who don't know him. That's my prayer for us. Let me pray that right now. God, I thank you for these who uh, stand in this room. There are many... Uh, who have known you for a long time and, and have, you know, uh, had opportunities galore to share their faith. And uh, uh, they've understood the joy of that and seeing someone uh, go from darkness to light. There's lots of us in here, though, that have never done that. They don't even begin to know what that looks like or how that would work. Uh, but here's what I trust. I trust that as we become more like you, as we seek to be like Christ, we'll, we'll understand that being like Christ is is being someone who multiplies, being someone who um, shares the good news like he did. 
It's what he's asked of us to do. It's what your hope for our discipleship um, um, you know, is centered on and, and, and certainly uh, is, is a big part of us becoming like Christ. So, so take us from where we are and surprise us. Surprise us with you know, uh, the equivalent of a fourth man in a threesome. Uh, surprise us with the conversations that you might give us, God, as we um, go through this week. And then just make us ready. Help us to be sensitive and ready. Trusting you for the courage and the words and leaving you with the results. That's my prayer for your church. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Love you guys. May God make us better at multiplying. Go talk to Celestin. He'd love to share with you about Alarm. I'll be over here in the corner. Have a great week as you go.